As we start our series on the advent of Christ, Christmas, I'd like for us to think about doing it God's way. There's a lot of different ways that people celebrate Christmas. We were at the shopping mall the other day. We saw all the decorations already up. The Christmas trees and the Santas and all the other christmas E type things. But I would like for us to concentrate on what the scripture says Christmas is. And we're going to do that for this whole month. And I would hope and pray that you would get just as excited as I am about this series. Because Christmas for me is probably the most wonderful time of the year because we celebrate our Lord's advent or his incarnation, God becoming man for us. The first talk in this series about doing Christmas God's way is not a sermon. We are going to have a history class. And my son, Nate's not here, he's a history teacher. I was hoping that he would show up again today so that he could tell me if I do a good job or not. Because I'm not going to be preaching, I'm going to be sharing the history, his story. History 101. Basically, everything that is about our history is about him. It's about Jesus. It's about God's redemptive plan. We're going to start from the very beginning. His coming that we celebrate has happened over a period of time. Christmas, when we think about Christmas in the scripture, we are celebrating a time period about four years. We start off with Zechariah and Elizabeth, and they had their son named John. Then the Roman decree came for a census. The message got to Mary from the angel, and then the message also to Joseph from the angel. Announcement going to have a child. Mary visits Elizabeth at that time. Then there's a journey to Bethlehem. Here we're getting closer and closer to that fateful night as they journey to Bethlehem. That night of his birth, his incarnation came. Then you see the shepherds hear the great announcement, probably the, the best announcement ever given to mankind, that the Savior has been born, Christ the Lord. After that, we see the Magi, we don't know if there were three of them. There were three presents, but we don't know how many Magi or wise men or three kings, we call it, showed up and to visit baby Jesus. But you know that was two years later because he came to the house. And Herod had commanded that all people under two years when they first saw the star, all the kids would be, would be killed. So we know it was at least two years after his birth. After that, they fled to Egypt. So all this that we study in the scripture and celebrate in Christmas has happened over a four-year period. The same thing will happen with the return of Christ. Everything that, And I hope this helps when you read about Jesus' second coming, that it's not just a one-day occurrence, but the scripture explains things in different timetables. And there's a period of time, uh, we won't get into that this morning, of many years about the second coming of Jesus. It's the same thing as when we celebrate the king's birthday. This is, of course, the king who passed away recently. But when you celebrate a king's birthday in Thailand, king's birthday is a series of events. Uh, you have a big dinner, and all of the dig dignitaries and visitors from all over come to this great dinner. There's a huge parade as well. The royal barge sometimes goes down uh, the Jao Piao River during the king's birthday. The military, all branches of the military present themselves in a big parade before the king. Presentation of their loyalty to the king on his birthday. Also, the government re-ratifies his kingship every year and his place as king of Thailand. Of course, there's a lot of sales at the mall on December 5th as well for the king's birthday. King's Park. <laughs> the king's park is decorated with flowers and fireworks. And that's a series about four or five days. You can go and see that happen. 
Uh, ten days. And then, the, of course, the king gives a speech. So what we are studying is the same type of birthday celebration as you would see for this king. But, but this is the king of kings and the lord of lords. I love this quote from Charles Spurgeon. It says, Christ is the great central fact in, worlds, in the world's history. To him, everything looks forward or backwards. All the lines of history converge upon him, upon Jesus. So let's start at the beginning. No, let's start before the beginning. Prehistory. God created and he created angels. And in his creation of angels, there was a specific beautiful angel whose name was Lucifer, the shining one, the morning star. And he rebelled against God, even though he was in the presence of God himself all the time. He wanted what God wanted. He wanted praise. Because of that, and because of that pride, God cast him down and he became Satan, or we call the devil. And he is the opposer and the accuser of all of God's creation. And the third of the angels, believe it or not, chose to go with him instead of staying with God. How this could be, we will never know, because we will never be an angel. But angels had one choice and one choice only. After that, because of their in the presence of the Lord, their state is sealed for all eternity. And so, in 1 Peter 5, 8, it says, Be a sober spirit, be on alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. In other words... The war began. The war began. At that point, we see the start of time, where God had created all of the heavens and the earth, and all that was on the earth, in the waters, and on the land. And then God created mankind. This was different than any of the other of God's creations, different than the angels, different than any of the created things, because this creation of mankind, this creation was to mirror God himself. And you know what a mirror is, right? When you, when you have a mirror, you look and you see a reflection of yourself, and God says, I'm going to create mankind who will image, mirror, who I am. We are a special creation because we can love. We are a special creation because we are intelligent. We are emotional. We have a will. We have a choice. We are able to love others. And all this reflects who God is in his character. He made us and he walked with us. Adam and Eve in the garden. It was a beautiful sight because God in the garden with man had absolutely no separation with Adam or Eve at any moment. Adam and Eve had access to God instantaneously with nothing in barrier between that relationship. They were sinless and they were beautiful and they were wonderful experiencing God's mirror image of who God is and will be forever. But then, something happened. And that is the start of sin. Satan, that devil, that accuser, that liar, came into the life of Eve and deceived her. And she did what God asked them not to do and took disobedient route and had the tree that was forbidden to eat of. He says, eat of any tree in this whole garden, any of them. They're all good, but don't eat of this one tree that eat knowledge of good and evil. But because of the war, Satan deceived Eve. Adam chose 
to go with Eve instead of to stay with God. And sin entered the world. What was the first response that God said to Adam and Eve after the fall, after sin entered into the world? What did God say? What was the very first thing that God said? Where are you? He heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord and among the trees of the garden, and the Lord God called out to man and said to him, Where are you? Where are you? The separation between man and God began because of sin. God did not say, You sinful person, God did not say, oh, come on, look what happened. Oh, no. He dealt specifically with the relationship that he had with man. He went straight to the relationship because they were together and there was nothing separating until that time. Then the start of the curse. The scripture tells us that in Genesis 3.15, he shall crush your head. He shall crush your head, and you shall strike him on the heel. A prophecy of what would happen to the enemy and to the man that God would send. Then curse showed its ugly fruit. Why was Cain's sacrifice rejected and Abel's sacrifice accepted by God? Well, God made it very specific that there should be some rules within sacrifices. We know that from the scripture. So we know that he probably had said that also to Abel. Now, you have to understand that Abel was a what? What did Abel do? He took care of sheep. Abel was a shepherd. Correct? Listen carefully. There's only one kind of animal in all creation. That is symbiotic with man. And that is sheep. Sheep cannot live without man. And back then, men, after the fall, could not live without sheep. Sheep nowadays would all be off this planet if man did not take care of the little lambs. There's no way that sheep could live. It's the only animal, the only animal that God created that is symbiotic with man. Abel was told to sacrifice a lamb. But Cain didn't do it correctly. Maybe he did it grudgingly. Maybe he did it in a way that was prideful. We don't know. But what we do know is that he did it wrong. He did not obey so what happened? At that point, Cain showed the ugliness of sin, which is what? Death. And he killed his brother. The Bible says that sin is crouching at your door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it, Cain. And that made Cain even worse. So he went out and took it out on his brother. And the nations began to form. God's love continued, more men, more sin, the war raged, and his story moved on. At that point, God had saw, in the heart of men was evil, all the time, without stop, intense hatred, lust, deceitfulness. Broken relationships, complete and total selfishness as expressions of what was in their heart. The Bible says the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The Lord was sorry that he made men. On the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man 
whom I have created from the face of the earth. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Mm. Noah found favor because Noah walked with God. The Bible says Noah walked with him. And so he told Noah, I'm going to start all over and I'm going to take you and your family and I'm going to put them in an ark. And they didn't even know what an ark was. It was a big boat. He had to describe it. He laid out the specifics of the ark. And then he said to Noah, I want you to gather in all the animals of the earth two by two. Those were the only the unclean animals went in two by two. But the clean animals went in seven by seven. What was part of the seven by seven? The sheep. The sheep were there. And they needed the sheep. They needed the lambs because it provided for them skins. It provided for them clothing. It provided for them meat. It provided for them all the things that they needed. And the lambs would not live without man. He started over again. And what did he tell Noah? When he got out of the boat, he says, Go, same thing he said to Adam and Eve, Go and fill the earth. Multiply. We want lots and lots of babies. Lots and lots of kids. Noah obeyed God to try to fill the earth. And there was a start of nations as a result. And in Genesis 11, 4, what did God tell Noah first? Go and fill the earth. Go and fill the earth. And all the people in Genesis 11 says, Come, let us build for ourselves a city. A tower whose top will reach into heaven. And let us make for ourselves a name. Otherwise, we will be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Why did they build a tower? They built a tower because they wanted it nice and tall. So that they would know where the city was. So they would not obey God by being scattered and fill the earth, but they would come together and they would build a city of men and they would come for a name for themselves. Do you see the disobedience? God said, go. And they said, we're staying. And what did God do? He <laughs> does what God does all the time. He takes care of man, even in the middle of his disobedience. And he confused it and gave them languages like tie. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In English, no, I don't know what it's like. <laughs> and he said to them as he scattered them off, what did he say? Multiply and fill the earth. I don't want you together to be strengthened. I want diversity. I want beauty and diversity. I want the earth to be filled. He said, multiply and fill the earth in Genesis 1, 28, in Genesis 6, 4, in Genesis 9, 1. And they disobeyed each time. But God, God made them do what God wanted. God's love continued. More men, more sin. The war raged and his story moved on. Then one day... When the nations were settled, God started to choose one for himself. God chose Abram. Abram was a moon worshiper. In Genesis 12, 1 says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. Why did God do that? Well, what is your country back then? The security of who you are. Why did he say to leave your father's house? Your identity and your, your position. Leave your country, your security, leave your people, your identity, leave your father, which is your position, because he was going to receive all of what his father would inherit to him. But God says, I don't want you dependent upon your country. I don't want you dependent upon your, your identity with your people, your own people. 
I don't want you to depend upon your father and his household and what he's done for you. I want you to depend upon me. So he called Abraham. Changed his name from Abram to Abraham. And he gave him a promise. God chose to obligate himself to humankind. God made a covenant. God made a promise. He obligated himself just as he did with Abel and with Noah when he told Noah that he would not destroy the world again by flood. He obligated himself once again and he says all nations will be blessed through Abraham and his seed and the Redeemer would come through him. Sarah, your wife, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. Genesis 22, where he says, Now take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah. Offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains which I will tell you. Oh, what a request. He wanted him to sacrifice his own son on a mountain. And Isaac, can you imagine? He wasn't a little boy. He wasn't like the age of prey. He was probably a teenager or older at the time. And Isaac asked his father, we have the wood, we have the fire, but where's the lamb for the sacrifice? Dad, Daddy, I, I noticed that you have all that you need. You have, you have the wood, you have the fire, but where is the lamb? And Abraham in faith says, God will provide the lamb for the sacrifice. In Genesis 22, 13, 14, it says, When Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his thorns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up as a burnt offering in the place of his son. Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. This is to show what God would do for mankind and the promise. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. God's love continued. More men, more sin. War rages. His story moves on. Joseph became a great, great man with a great number of descendants. He went into Egypt, and you know the story. And Pharaoh saw that the number of the Jewish men were beyond what they could handle. Kept them in slavery for 400 years. Why well, in slavery for 400 years? Do you know that God told Abraham that he would do this? Because God says, I want my people to come out with a great possession in their hands and in their pockets. I want to punish Egypt for their sin. I'm waiting for the sin of the people in the promised land to get to its highest amount. Because when we go in there, we're going to kill them all. And because I want my people to be a great nation depending upon me. God hardened Pharaoh's heart. What did Moses need? Abel needed a lamb. Abraham needed a lamb. Moses needed a lamb. Sacrifice and put the blood over the door, the mantle of each door. The great deliverance, the blood of the lamb on the posts as the angel of the Lord passed over them. God with man in perfect garden, but now living with God, even when they sin. That's a different arrangement. 
in the dusty, dirty wilderness, God still is holy. The law was given to protect God's holiness and to protect men from God. To teach them about their sin, to teach them about their need. The sacrifices were put into place, sacrificing the lambs. A loving provision. God stayed with them. He presenced himself with them. A perfect picture of redemption. Just as Abraham, God would provide under his way, not men's way. Into the promised land, they did not obey and the nations took over and they were scattered in exile. God raised up the prophets. Touching God through the word of God that was given to people for God's people. The promise to Adam and Eve, to Noah, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to Moses, and now to Israel. All the prophecies came. And I'd like to take a little break. And I want to discuss this. We can start with the evidence of the fulfillment of these prophecies. Because this, you have to understand, comes from the word of God. As the strongest evidence we have as Christians to the coming Messiah. 333 prophecies about the coming of Jesus. Did you hear me? The advent of Christ had 333 prophecies. A prophecy is something long ago, hundreds of years ago, sometimes even a thousand years ago, that was written down about someone that would come. If any of them were wrong, then it would not work. 333. Jesus himself said, when I was with you before, I told you that everything written about me by Moses and the law and the prophets and the Psalms must all come true. It all has to come true. Let's look at it this way. My name is Raymond J. Foster. There's no one that I know of that has that name. I live in Thailand, but let's make it even a little bit more precise. I live, maybe I shouldn't tell the exact address because this video will be going online on YouTube for all the world to see. I live in Butterfly Condo off of Bang Na Trot in Bang Na. That's my district, my sub-district in Samut Prakat, which is my province in Thailand, in Southeast Asia, in Asia, in the earth, in the solar system, in the Milky Way, in the universe. Let's go backwards. Universe, Milky Way, Solar System, Teha, Earth, Asia, Asia Southeast Asia, Thailand, Samutra Khan, help me out. Bang Kiao, Bang Kli, Bang Kiao, Bang Na, Bang Na Klat. Butterfly condo. Number. Nobody else in all the world lives where I live. Does that make sense? No one else in all of history lives where I live. Nobody lived in my condo before me because the condo wasn't built before me. No one can mistake my address. This is what the prophecy has done. This Messiah would be born of a woman. The Messiah would, have, Noah had three sons, Ham, Shem, and Jacob. He would be born of Shem. The scripture says that he would be born through the line of Abraham. The scripture says in Isaiah 11 that he will be born from Jacob. And in Jeremiah 23 from Jesse. 
In Psalms 22, he would be the Messiah who would be crucified. Thousands of people were crucified, yes, but the method of crucifixion wasn't even devised 800 years when the prophecy was made. The number of prophecies in just Psalms 41 and Zechariah 11. He was betrayed by a friend, 30 pieces of silver, thrown on the floor, not the table, in the temple, and the money was used to buy the potter's field, all hundreds of years before it happened. So we can see this, just for fun. The seed of a woman, descendant of Abraham, the line of Isaac, the line of Jacob, the tribe of Judah, the family of Jesse, the house of David, crucified, betrayed by a friend, 30 pieces of silver on the floor of the temple, used to buy the potter's field. He was born in Bethlehem. I said there were 333. If there were only eight that was fulfilled, it'd be like this. This is the state of Texas where I'm from. If you take a silver dollar, it's a coin in the United States, and you mark it with an X, and you fill up my whole state. Now let me give you an illustration about this. Thailand has 513,000 square kilometers. That's the size of Thailand. Texas has 629,000 square kilometers. That's a big state. If I fill this up with silver dollars and I mark an X, and I fill it up all the way up to my waist, and I mix it all up in the whole state, and then I blindfold myself, and I, to, and I can say I can walk any way I want to go for miles upon miles upon miles, and if I pick up that one coin with an X, it's the same probability of only eight of all the prophecies that I just said to be fulfilled in Jesus. It points to only one man. Only one man. That's eight. Now, if 48, 48 prophecies were fulfilled, it would be one to the tenth of 157 power. Anyone mathematicians here? 1 to the 10th of 157 zeros. And that's 48 prophecies. And let me tell you something. How many atoms do scientists guess contains in all of the known universe? 1 and 10 to the 79th power. Do you know what I'm saying? That's only 48 of the prophecies. They were 333. Meaning, this man is coming, and he's going to be like this, and it only can be him. And he came. How did he come? God's love continued, more men, more sin, war rages. His story moves on. God chose a woman. And in that choosing of Mary, he gave an announcement. And he said to Mary, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom will have no end. There also had to be another announcement because Joseph, if I was him, I'd need one myself too. The angel came to Joseph and said, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus, which means Savior, for he will save his people from their sin. Amen. 
then came the biggest announcement that's ever made by heaven itself. And it was made to whom? Shepherds taking care of what? Sheep. I don't think that was a coincidence. These are the same sheep, by the way, that were being taken care of for the sacrifices at the temple. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And the angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there was born for you a Savior was Christ the Lord the incarnation God becoming flesh God taking on human form now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet behold the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. Emmanuel. It seems like God made a way. It seems like God would provide. It seems like the question that God had in the garden, Adam, where are you? He found us. And it was confirmed by the old man Simeon as they brought him to the temple. The prophecy again, again was fulfilled as God had told him. Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. And he said to Mary that your, your heart will be pierced. Behold, John the Baptist says. Behold, he says, the forerunner of Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb, the God-man, Jesus. God's Son, God of the flesh. Why did God have to do this? Listen carefully. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God for whom all through whom and through whom everything existed should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. Both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them their brothers. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers in the presence of the congregation and I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him and again say, here I am, O God. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humility. So that by his death, he might destroy him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. And free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For the reason he had to be made like his brothers in every way. In order that he might become the merciful and faithful high priest in service to God. And that he might make an atoning sacrifice for sins of all the people. Because he himself suffered. He was tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. 
the enemy was broken. The sacrifice of the Lamb was made. God will provide. Amen? Sacrifice of the Son. Eternal man stepped into time. The Word became flesh. Promises of long ago became true. The true sacrifice was to be prepared and the Lamb was provided. And He is the radiance of His glory and the exact representation of His nature. And upholds all things by the word of His power. When He had made purification of sins, He sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. He conquered death. He rose again. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The Lamb, from the beginning of time, He was foreseen, and He came to give us a new life. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, He is a new creation. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Because of Christmas, He gave us a new life. And He's coming again. He's coming again. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is now among men. Oh my goodness. It's better than the garden. For now we can't sin. The sin has been taken care of. And He will dwell among them. And they shall be His people. And God Himself will be among them. And He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will be no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write these words, for these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who is thirsty from the spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. His story. Where are you? He found us. He paid a great price. Let's pray together.